Let's come again in prayer before our great God. Prepare our hearts, O God, to receive in them your word and the living word, Jesus Christ, your Son, our God and Savior. It's in his name we ask. Amen. Joy to the world. As I mentioned last week, it's a hymn that was written by Isaac Watts, or rather a poem first, and then turned into a hymn. It's to help us to joyfully celebrate and hopefully anticipate the kingship of Jesus Christ over his people and over the entire world. Makes me wonder, though, what sort of joy and hope this hymn is really talking about. I ask that to myself, especially this week, As I look at the lyrics to this song, especially in the third verse, for example, it talks about sins and sorrows being no more. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. If you've lived on this earth more than two minutes, you know that this is not our current experience. This world is not sin-free. This world is not void of sorrow, at least not fully yet. Jesus told us in the Gospels that we should not be alarmed when we hear about the brokenness of this world. Why? Because as he says in Mark 13, verse 7, the end is not yet. Does that word from Christ discourage you this morning? The end is not yet. Perhaps this season, especially after the year that we've had, you need a good message from the Lord that gives you joy and hope. You might be surprised to find that such a message can be found in the small Old Testament book of Zephaniah. Yes, Zephaniah really is a book of the Bible. It's sandwiched in between the books of Habakkuk and Haggai. Let me just outline some important features of this small prophecy, Zephaniah since most of us are probably unfamiliar with it. The message of Zephaniah is about how Judah's refusal to repent of her evil and wickedness in the face of imminent terrifying judgment of the Lord upon the nations around her are going to result in her own judgment. Yet Judah is encouraged to wait for the time when, after judgment, the Lord will purify, save, protect, restore, and bless them. The purpose of Zephaniah is multifaceted in that it is meant to proclaim judgment on the wicked in the world, in the nations that surrounded Judah, and in Judah herself. It's to proclaim the day of the Lord as a time when Yahweh will come to judge and to deliver, to expose Judah's unwillingness to accept correction from Yahweh, also to expose the unfaithfulness of Judah's own leaders, and to encourage Judah to accept correction from Yahweh by hearing of the judgment that is about to befall their own neighbors. The prophecy of Zephaniah teaches us two important lessons as modern day readers. Firstly, the first two-thirds of the book of Zephaniah teaches that God is angry with sin and that sinners are in the crosshairs of his looming judgment. Chapter 1 verses 2 to 4 set the tone of the entire book. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Humanity wants to hear that sin is not all that serious or concerning. God's people, Judah at that time, and even us today, want this to be the case as well. But Zephaniah's prophecy uncovers the reality that our sin is far worse than we think it is, and that God, in his holiness, sees our sin, and it must be dealt with accordingly. However, the final third of the book of Zephaniah's prophecy has a more uplifting message in it for us. It teaches us a second lesson. 
that God is shockingly gracious to sinners who only deserve his judgment. In chapter 3, following the prophecy of judgment upon the city of Jerusalem and the nations around Judah, verses 9 to 20 of chapter 3 prophesies that the nations are going to become worshipers of Yahweh, while Yahweh is going to save his remnant, causing his people to rejoice as he protects, restores, and blesses them. And so this offers two further purposes of this small Old Testament book of Zephaniah. One, to proclaim joy and hope for the people of Yahweh. And secondly, to describe the ultimate changes which Yahweh will bring about as the nations become worshipers of him and he becomes the king and defender of his people. O. Palmer Robertson, who is a commentator, lends his voice and his commentary on this prophetic book, saying, one of the most moving descriptions of the love of God for his people found anywhere in scripture appears in these closing verses of Zephaniah. So let me read this moving description of God's love for his people in Zephaniah chapter 3, beginning in verse 14 through the end of the book in verse 20. These closing verses of the book have appropriately been called the gospel according to Zephaniah. So hear Zephaniah's gospel message this morning. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He's cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord, your God, is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast. And I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. So right now in this world, we have a problem. This world is not sin-free, nor is it void of sorrow. Therefore, we are a people much in need of joy and hope. We need to see how God overcomes our deepest problems of sin and sorrow. And that's what our passage details with a message full of joy and hope that Jesus will come to reverse the curse and make his blessings flow. My purpose today as we look at these closing verses of Zephaniah is to fill us with much joy and hope in believing that Jesus will return as king to rid this world of sin, to remove any cause of sorrow, and to make his blessings flow upon his people. I'm going to divide these closing verses into two parts to examine this morning. We'll focus first on the problem of the curse that is to be reversed by the king, and then secondly, the promise of the king's blessings to be revealed. So firstly... Let's see mainly how the problem of the curse is reversed by the king when he returns. Zephaniah in verse 14 has an exhortation to give God's people, which is very similar to Psalm 98, which we looked at last week. And then in verse 15, Zephaniah has a word of exhortation, or explanation rather, and encouragement for God's people. So he begins with an exhortation in verse 14 saying, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Zephaniah's exhortation here is for God's people to sing, to shout, to rejoice and exult with all their heart. Why? What for? It seems a little out of place for such activity given the coming judgment of the Lord that has been previously announced by the prophet Zephaniah. What cause is there for joy in light of this judgment. Well, the prophet goes on to explain in verse 15 with some encouraging words. 
The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. Zephaniah had been given a word from the Lord about Judah's future. He describes a day when the Lord will cease punishing his rebellious people for their sins. Not even God's own people are exempt from the curse of sin. Just like the nations who were around them, the people of Judah were caught up in wickedness and idolatry. They deserved God's judgment. And yet, Zephaniah declares that when the Lord comes to rule as their king, he will reverse two particular problems of this curse of sin. One problem of the curse to be removed will be the penalty for sin. The penalty for sin will be removed. The first and the third lines of verse 15 outline two penalties for sin that are going to be removed by the king. Line one says, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. The penalty for Judah's sin here has warranted the Lord's condemnation. It's the first penalty. But this judgment, as the Lord declares, is not going to last forever over them. God would one day take this judgment of condemnation away. We can safely say that this has been fulfilled in stages for God's people Judah over the centuries. It was partially fulfilled in Judah's restoration after their deportation and captivity in Babylon. It was more fully fulfilled when their Messiah came to bear their sins and the penalty for their sin on the cross to remove God's judgment against any who would trust in him. And it's going to be fully realized completely when Messiah comes again as their king. In Christ Jesus, there is no more condemnation. The penalty for sin has been removed from all who place their faith in Christ's substitutionary sacrifice on the cross. All sins, past, present, and future, have been dealt with by God through Christ to all who believe. God's wrath for our sins is removed if we would trust in Christ because Christ bore the wrath deserved for us. The second penalty for sin that's going to be removed by the king when he returns is implied in line 3 of verse 15. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. The curse of sin brought condemnation upon all people, in this case Judah specifically, but it also brought separation from God. That's the second penalty. Sin separates the holy from the unholy. It breaks apart the relationship between the Creator and His creatures. Sin divided the hearts of God's people. They chose to serve other gods rather than the one true God. Their sin drove a wedge between them and the Lord. And that's what sin does for all people. It separates us from God. It separates us from true life, true joy, true peace, true love. Sin makes us chase after shadows while drawing us further and further away from God. But the good news is that Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near, Paul wrote to the Ephesian believers. And how does he say we were brought near? By the blood of Christ. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. The good news of Christmas is that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1.14. The good news of Good Friday is that through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, he made peace by the blood of his cross. Colossians 1.20. The good news of Easter is that we will always be with the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4.17. The good news of His ascension is that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who has given us confidence to enter the holy places by His blood, allowing us to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean. 1 John 2.2 2 and Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 22. And the good news of this second advent, as we've just read in verse 15 of Zephaniah 3, is that the king of Israel, the Lord, 
will be in our midst. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. These are the two penalties for sin that are going to be removed by the king when he comes, reversing these penalties entirely. No more condemnation, no more separation. Another problem with the curse of sin that's going to be removed will be the power of sin. Again, this can be seen in lines 2 and 4 of verse 15. He has cleared away your enemies. You shall never again fear evil. Real quickly, I want to note two powers of sin that are going to be removed according to the prophet. The first power is opposition from enemies. For the people of Judah, that would eventually be the Babylonians and then the Persians later. God's discipline upon his people Judah through these two powers is not going to last forever, as the Lord promises here. Eventually, Judah would return to rebuild the temple and the city of Jerusalem in order to worship and dwell in the land once again. And of course, not even this restoration, though, would be complete and last forever. We know again and again enemies have come upon Judah and have opposed them over the centuries. The Greeks and the Roman Empire most prominently in history, I believe. Yet when the true king of Judah comes to establish his earthly kingdom, Judah will no longer face any opposition from any enemy. This will be the case for all God's chosen people. All enemies, physical and spiritual, are going to be conquered and destroyed entirely. God's people will dwell in safety, just as uh, Jeremiah prophesied in Jeremiah 33. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. The second power of sin that's going to be removed will be consternation. You shall never again fear evil, verse 15 ends. Fear will no longer be a stumbling block or a snare. Evil is going to be rooted out. It will be melted away like dross, and what will remain will be pure gold, righteousness, and perfect harmony. Judah and us who believe can look forward to a day when the ransom to the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads and they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. In sum, the Lord is going to take away the judgments against his people entirely. The penalty for sin will be utterly obliterated. The power of sin will flee away. Even now, as we await the coming day of Christ, we're assured that there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We who were far off have been brought near. He will never leave us nor forsake us, and sin no longer has dominion over us since we are under grace and we've been set free from sin. No more condemnation, no more separation, no more opposition, no more consternation. So much for these problems of the curse that will be reversed by our king. Now then, let's view the promise of the king's blessings which are going to be revealed. As if the removal of these penalties and powers of sin weren't enough for us to rejoice over. In the closing verses, there are many promises that are uh, going to come and bless God's people. A few of these are mentioned through the prophet as the mouthpiece of God but then more blessings are promised by the Lord's own tongue. All in all, I've counted 13 different blessings God's people are promised between verses 17 and verse 20. But rather than spending time on all 13, I've done my best to try and group them into six promised blessings for the king, uh, from the king to his people. The first of the six promised blessings is one that's already been mentioned, but it's worth repeating because Zephaniah repeats it. The king promises the blessing of his presence. Verse 17, the Lord your God is in your midst. Actually, the language is much stronger than the king simply dwelling among us or with us, beside us. The Hebrew word is used throughout the Old Testament 
to refer to the inner organs of the body, including the heart as the psychological center of man's inner being. David prayed to the Lord for repentant, in repentance in uh, Psalm 51, saying, renew a right spirit within me. It's the same word used here in Zephaniah 3.17. What's even more intriguing, at least to me as a student of the languages, is that the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, translates Zephaniah 3.17 as, the Lord your God is in you. Now, the Septuagint was written before the time of Jesus, yet the, great, the same Greek word used for Lord here in Zephaniah 3.17 is used everywhere else in the New Testament to identify Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, what I'm getting at is that Christ's personal presence is far more intimate than that he simply dwells among us. Paul says, to the Colossian believers, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christmas is all about the witness of Jesus. Not only is Jesus Emmanuel, God with us, he is also God within us right now through his Holy Spirit. But one day he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. His presence is blessing God's people right now. They're enjoying his presence right now, but one day they're going to enjoy it more fully in his physical bodily presence. A second promised blessing of the king to his people is his power. His power. Zephaniah says he is a mighty one who will save. This speaks of a warrior who's proven himself to be strong and successful in battle. We see that this coming king is not some wimp cowering back on his throne, letting his army do the work for him. Instead, he's depicted as a valiant warrior king going out in the front lines of battle, able to deliver his people from all their enemies by his own hand. F.B. Meyer offers a rather long comment, but it's, it's worth meditating upon. He says, As God took the side of his people against their foes, talking about Judah, and will do so again in the final struggle, so will he take our side against our sins. He has saved us from the penalty of sin. He will also save us from its power. Your foes may be as numerous as the devils in hell, strong and wily, but he will save. Your temperament may be as susceptible to temptation as an aspen leaf is to the wind, but he will save. Your past years, by repeated acts of indulgence, may have formed habits strong as iron bands, but he will save. Your circumstances and companions may be most unfavorable to a life of victory, but he will save. Difficulties are not to him. The darkness shines as the day. When all hope seems lost in this world because of the over overwhelming force that's gathered against you, we can take heart that the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings to deliver us by his power. Another blessing that's promised by the king is his praise. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will exalt over you with loud singing. What do you think God thinks about you? Is he angry with you? Is he disappointed in you? Is he just waiting to drop the hammer on you? Not according to Zephaniah, he's not. God loves and delights in his people if you are, in fact, his child. Does it shock you to your core that God rejoices over you with gladness and he actually sings over you loudly because of you? We're often told that the God of the Old Testament is some stern and super serious God. But this verse totally undoes all that nonsensical thinking. God rejoices in his people, and he promises to do so forever. 
Isaiah, as we've read earlier, likens God to a bridegroom rejoicing over his people who are likened to his bride. In some cultures, at a wedding, the groom is so overjoyed by the sight of his bride that it was actually customary for him to burst out into song, expressing his deepest love and affections for her. How much more does Christ rejoice over his bride, the church, out of love and pleasure in her? We can hear the echoes of his love song for his church through the words of the gospel. And soon we're going to hear that song loud and clear as we're presented before him at the wedding feast of the Lamb. A fourth promised blessing from the king is his peace. He will quiet you by his love. I like how other translations put it. He will be silent in his love. And another says, he will renew you in his love. The idea is threefold from these translations. First, the Lord, like a judge who has reached a verdict, will rest his case against us. Since he has removed his judgments against us and he's drawn us near to himself through Jesus Christ, no more will he condemn us because of our sins. Christ has made sure of this through his death. Second, because of his love for us in Christ, he's renewed a right spirit within us and given us new life by his spirit. And third, as a result of Christ's work on the cross and the spirit's own work within us, We as believers have become children of God, meaning we're no longer enemies at war with Him, but members of His family who rest in peace and harmony with Him. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. That's what Christ came to bring that first Christmas. Peace I leave with you, Jesus said, nearing His crucifixion. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And when he returns, he will make this blessing of peace flow all the more vibrantly when he reigns as the Prince of Peace. Additionally, the Lord himself speaks in Zephaniah 3, verse 18, to the first half of verse 20, promising to bless his people with his protection. His protection. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together. Just mark the language of protection in the Lord's promise here. I will gather I will deal with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will bring you in. I will gather you together. Two things I want to mention here. Consider first who is doing the protecting, and then consider who needs the protecting. Over and over, the Lord emphasizes He will be the protector. He has a personal interest in the condition of of his people. There's almost a subliminal imagery of shepherding here in this verse. In Ezekiel, the Lord uses very similar language, saying to his people, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among the sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. The Lord is the good shepherd who is going to protect his sheep. Already we've seen this loving shepherd protect his sheep to such a degree 
that he's laid down his own life for them, and he so holds them in his hand that none shall ever perish. Consider also who needs this protection from the Lord. According to the Lord's own words in Zephaniah, it's those who mourn and suffer reproach, those who are oppressed, those who are lame and need of saving and healing, those who are considered outcasts, those who are ashamed and humbled, those who are of little account in the eyes of the world, those who are scattered and in need of shelter. These are the sheep that the shepherd king will protect in one arm while swinging his staff in the other to smite the ravenous wolves and the thieves who have come to prey and destroy the weak. Are you weary and in need of rest this morning? Mourning and longing for comfort, feeling worthless and wonder if God even sees and cares about you, weak and frail, desiring strength, sinful and in need of a Savior, scattered and lonely, seeking a place to belong. Jesus Christ, the mighty warrior, the friend of sinners, the defender of the indefensible, the justifier of the unjust, welcomes you into his safe sheep pen called the church. This church, Taylorville Evangelical Free Church, has doors that are wide open to welcome you with the love of Jesus this season. It's our desire to help you find the protection, the peace, security, joy, and hope that is offered in the gospel. It's our purpose, in fact, to point you to the only one who will keep you from all evil, the only one who will keep your life, who has promised to keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Find shelter and comfort eternally from all your sins and sorrows in the arms of the shepherd king. And then the sixth promised blessing of the king to his own people is his provision. The final words of the book of Zephaniah is the best news in all the world for God's people. The book began with God declaring over his own people, I will stretch out my hand against you. But it ends with the Lord saying, I will restore your fortunes before your eyes. Restore your fortunes. It's a Hebrew idiom that takes place throughout the Old Testament some 20 times. And in every case, the Lord is the subject of, the one who restores the fortunes, whether that be freedom from captivity, the returning of possessions or property, or renewing some fallen spiritual condition. And the objects of such glorious uh, restoration and provision are typically God's own people, but in a few instances, thankfully, other nations benefit from the Lord's restoration as well. This promise of provision and restoration come through the words of Jeremiah to the people of Judah. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And James applies this same promise to the Gentiles, not just to the people of Israel and Judah, but also to the nations, quoting from the prophet Amos in his sermon as he stands up in Acts chapter 15. James says, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins." And I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. But lest we think that this is a blessing only in the distant future for us, consider the Apostle Paul's confidence in the Lord's present provision for God's people right now, saying, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Needless to say, the Lord provides all that we need for today, all that we'll need for tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and forevermore. What a sweet, 
grouping of promised blessings. What a glorious king we have, a king who is within us and will be with us all of the days of our life, a king who is mighty to save, a king who loves and delights and sings over us, a king who brings perfect peace, a king who protects and defends us, a king who provides far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. What are we to do about all of this? How are we to respond? Zephaniah's exhortation is quite appropriate in verse 14. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Be filled with joy and hope this season. As you recall, what Jesus Christ has accomplished by His grace for you. Even now, you can begin to experience victory because of what He has done in reversing the curse of sin through the cross and resurrection. Even now, you can begin to enjoy the blessings that flow from His love and faithfulness to you. Rejoice that because of Christ's perfect life and His atoning death, the Lord's anger is but for a moment and His favor is for a lifetime. Your weeping may tarry for the night, but there is hope because the King of joy will come at the dawning of a new day. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit which resides within us be with you all from this day forth and forevermore. Go in His peace and in His love.